Hello and welcome everyone to our AP Literature and Composition Updates webinar. We are so delighted to have everyone with us today. Um, we have you for one hour from 6 to 7 and I know uh, some folks will be scooting off to another webinar that happens to be tonight on AP Literature. So you'll be uh, no doubt getting a lot of information tonight on AP Literature and the new updates um, and we're delighted to be a part of that. Um, just some quick uh, housekeeping and table setting items. If you have the menu pulled up, you can see that there's two sections for submitting questions. There's the questions tab um, and the chat tab. They're very similar. Um, it's just kind of how you interact with the host or with others. So just, you know, select my name if you want to interact just with me. I'm Lisa Erdely. Um, or you can also interact with the person labeled as High School Marketing, which is um, our marketing associate, Tiffany Tang. Anything you send directly to Larry and, Ra and Renee, they probably won't see during the webinar. So I would suggest sending those questions to me. So th thank you all for being here. We are recording. So if you do have to spin off a few minutes early and you missed the last couple of minutes, we'll make sure we get the recording and the slides out to everyone um, you know, with, by the end of the week. Um, and then any questions we don't get to answer, I invite you to send to me. Again, my name is Lisa Erdely, and my email is L Erdely, just first name, last last name, sorry, first initial last name. And I'm listed there under staff, um, and I'm at bfwpub.com, and I'll mention that again at the end. So we'll try to get to everyone's questions. Uh, really briefly, I just want to thank Renee and Larry for both being here again uh, two weeks in a row for my uh, my re webinar request, Renee has been en route all day traveling, and I'm grateful that she was able to get a flight home in time to um, to be here today. Was all. So it all worked out. Um, that's a very good thing. So we have Renee Shea, who many of you know, um, formerly of Bowie State University and the co-author of so many books from Bedford that I would be here all day listing them, but I'll just say the language of composition for AP Lang and for our purposes here, literature and composition. Um, as well as our American Lit uh, text that also incorporates nonfiction, and our pre-AP books, Advanced Lang and Lit and Foundations of Lang and Lit. As many of you know, Renee has been working with the College Board for years in almost every position you can you can list um, as an advisor for AP Lang, um, the liaison position with the Development Committee, um, and as well as uh, being a workshop leader and a number of other um, positions with College Board. Many of you know her as a workshop leader, and uh, we thank you all for um, following Renee on all of her webinars. I always get nice comments from folks that have taken workshops with Renee, so thank you. Um, and we also have Larry with us, Larry Scanlon. Um, Larry has, uh, is also the author on um, the language of composition for the AP Language Force and Literature and Composition, as well as the Conversations in American Literature, our um, American Lit and Nonfiction text for 11th grade. Um, Larry's been um, a teacher in, in high schools for a few decades, sorry Larry, <laughs> to say a few decades, mm -hmm. but um, for 30 years, um, where he taught AP Lang and Lit. And he's also um, been teaching freshman comp at Iona College in New Rochelle. And as you all know, likely, he's been a reader and table leader for the Lang exam for the last two decades, as well as serving on the test development committee um, for that course as well. Um, and again, many of you know and have taken workshops with Larry in both Lang and Lit, and we are delighted to have you here with us as well. Those of you that know Larry um, in person, again, keep the great comments coming. We'd love to hear them in the in the chat there. And uh, we are so delighted to have our, um, our AP experts with us here today to help clear up some things and explain um, what the new uh, frameworks mean and reflect a little bit on this year's exam and then think about um, what this means for the 2019-2020 school year. So thank you both so much for being here. Um, and without further ado, I'll turn things over to you, Larry and Renee. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, Larry and I are delighted to be here. And um, I'm just noticing that um, I was charging everything very quickly because I just got back a little while ago. Um, and I'm going to have to make sure my phone is, is going to stay with me for the rest of the time here. So I may have to jump off for a second and, and find another charger cord. Um, I apologize. But let me give you a sense of what we're going to try to do tonight. In a, we're going to try to cover a lot of information in a short period of time. We are going to reflect on the 2019 exam as kind of context, and I think in many ways an introduction then to some of the um, 
the reasons behind the new framework. Um, we're going to talk about those. Larry is going to uh, lead most of that discussion. He just gave a talk with teachers in uh, upstate New York on uh, Tuesday, actually, for, um, on that subject. And then we are going to talk about the changes. There were some revisions made um, and sent out, put on AP Central in, two, in uh, September, just the September 30th. Then we're also going to talk about the six-point rubric, which Larry and I are both very um, favorably inclined um, about. We really, we really like it. We think it's going to be helpful for both students and teachers. And then we're going to end today with a little discussion about uh, lit and comp literature and composition and how that works with the unit framework of the College Board. And I'm going to uh, talk about, I'm going to use the example of everyday use as unit one, as a, and just to show you how you can, um, you can integrate some of the materials from literature and composition and how it works very well with the College Board's materials and, and approaches and how the two will mesh. So I think I'm going to get started here by, um, oh dear, something else just came on my computer. I apologize. I don't know oh, why all those things are coming up. But we're gone now. I'm good. Um, the, the math is supposed to behave itself, but it, it didn't at that moment. Um, so as Lisa said, please send questions to her. Larry and I are probably both looking at a pad of notes. At the same time, we have, uh, we're looking at the slides. So we'll be happy to answer your questions either at the very end of the webinar. We will leave some time. And if we don't have time for that, Lisa follows up and she often will forward questions to us and then she'll get back to you. So one way or another, we'll make sure that, that we answer your questions as best as, that we can. So I'm going to start here. Yep. Oh, dear. I'm, I'm trying to move right there. Um, okay. I have to move my slide a little bit. Is that on the screen just fine, Lisa? Is our Larry? That's just, is, that's just fine, fine for me. It's right there, center. Okay, <laughs> I I had to move it over. I had the the, yeah. the uh, some of the other um, um, functions, I suppose, were were blocking it for me. Um, in 2019, there there were no real dramatic changes, although there were some favorable movements. Um, again, about around 365,000 exams, pretty good. Um, nearly 50% um, were three or higher, but the overall mean score was a 2.61 out of 5. Not a, not a tremendously high score, but the good news here, and I have TP is Trevor Packer. The, uh, you probably know him. He does lots of tweeting, and he's a, uh, a wonderful leader of the Advanced Placement Program in the College Board. And uh, this year, poetry and prose were very close. And as most of you know, if you're experienced teachers, the prose fiction has been lagging. And prose fiction has been a real problem for students. That seems to be the most difficult. The open question is usually um, the highest of the three. But this year, poetry and prose were very close. And you'll see a, a comment from Trevor saying that uh, it increased the percentage of students co uh, scoring a three. And so he sends kudos to AP teachers for reversing a multi-year decline in literary analysis. And I, I think that you know, he is hoping, we are all are hoping, that the frameworks will, will also help with that. Um, and also, Trevor commented that the multiple, for the multiple choice, uh, AP Lit students scored about as well on the poetry analysis as they did on the prose analysis. So again, those two close reading um, uh, assessments, um, the one with an essay, the other with multiple choice, seem to be coming together, which is, um, again, a tribute to those of you who are teaching these courses, or this particular course. Um, I just want to end by saying of the multiple choice, 21 of the questions this year were 20th to 21st century. 34 were on pre-20th century. This will change in 2020. And Larry's going yeah. to be talking about yeah. that. Yeah, as we'll see later, that, that's one of the major changes. Uh, there aren't too many structural changes to the literature exam, unlike the language. But this is this will be one of them, as we'll see. OK. Well, I'm going to um, turn it yeah, over to this, Larry this, now. Larry, yeah. excuse me, we just wanted to say, if, if any of you, the teachers happen to have their binder with them, we actually are using information from the binder here. We're doing some quoting and using that as a jumping off point here. So this this is actually from um, the introduction to the um, to the material. 
So if you have your teacher's materials there, some, some of this, um, it, 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 we're just using bullet points, but it's more fully uh, explained there. Okay, Larry, sorry to interrupt you. I said Larry and I like an old married couple. Okay, we work sure. together for so long that we interrupt one another. Um, oh, sure, we, we certainly do. Okay, so um, here we go. So the first bullet that we think is really important is this general description of what we do. Uh, I'm not going to read that too much, but you know, the careful reading and critical analysis of literary works selected locally, okay, test to many people. Um, the important one here is the second one, frameworks, but not a curriculum. Um, I'll say two things. The direct quotation from page 11 in your binder or your CED says that this publication is not a curriculum. And now a quotation from um, College Board um, leaders is, the binder contains a framework, the teacher constructs a curriculum. And I really like that bottle sentence. The binder is the framework, but the teacher constructs the curriculum. Okay, next slide. We're going to try to move fast because we have a lot to cover, and we know that <laughs> the next um, uh, webinar is, is, is probably going to be attracting many of you from, from here. Okay, so um, College Board provides clarity regarding this is the intent now in the new TED that everything will be much more clear and less mysterious for teachers. Um, one benefit is to provide interested teachers with formative assessments. Now these, as you know, will be what you'll find on the personal progress checks and they are to be used as formative assessments only, as we know. There are actual penalties for schools that use these um, for summative or for grades. Uh, another interesting thing that we might get to, and if not, I'll, we could send it afterwards, is um, you know some variations on the one to six scale with sliding scores. Um, and that's, that's a, a formative approach to the scoring itself. Okay, and finally, teachers can choose to organize their course by themes, which of course makes us happy because all of our books have been, well, this book, especially the literature book, has been um, organized by theme. And that's the way I've always taught, and I know, Renee, you as well, I think many of us do that way. By the way, um, if you want to check with your binder, we're on page 11. Okay, now let's move on to the big ideas. We know that this course now is organized according to what College Board, said, board has been designated as big ideas and skill categories. So we have the first six. We have character, setting, structure, now plot and structure, narration, narrator, speaker, and then figure of language, which is really divided into two separate um, points. Um, word choice, imagery, and symbols, and then the second one is called comparison. So there we have metaphor, etc. So there, there we have the, the, uh, the fifth one. And finally, literary argumentation. One of the big overall principles for both frameworks for the English courses is that everything is an argument. No, it's not. Yes, it is. People <laughs> attempted humor there, sorry. So um, the skill categories here are on page 19. And I've gone through the binder several times, both of them, and I would say that if I were to pick one page out of the binder to have right in my left hand, as it were, through the year, it's page 19. And I think that's a better, that would be a better wall poster than the one that's in the binder, actually. Page 19, we might keep going back to. Okay, let's go to the next uh, Le slide. Larry, before, before we go to the next slide, let me just say something about lit literary argumentation. Um, the College Board is making this explicit right now. I think most of us who've worked on question three, whether as readers or as question writers or whatever, have always seen the open question as argumentation, especially if there was a quotation involved or any kind of interpretation. That's, that's what we do. But the nice thing now is that that literary argumentation is actually going to be spelled out as part of the rubric. And so that connection, I think, is a lot cleaner. Um, so I just wanted yes. to add that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. OK, very good. Um, OK, so here we have the nine units. 
um, first being short fiction. And if you read this in your binder, you'll discover that the recommendation early in the year for many schools is that students begin by writing paragraphs, not full essays, about short fiction. And part of this um, has come down, and I'll quote, you know, college board voices. Um, this has come from higher ed who recognize that what they really want from students early on in their English courses is the ability to write clear, cohesive, uh, cohesive and cogent paragraphs when they get there. Um, okay. Um, and the same information you'll find in Unit 2. Then when we get to Unit 3, and we're not going to be going in detail of these, but long fiction or drama, um, long fiction or drama 1, that, that should be. But, um, uh, uh, this quotation I listed from page 49 in the binder, and this is something that we've, we've said and know for years and years and years, back in the 1900s, as many of us remember, is that students need to know a few texts well, a few texts well for the longer words. Okay, and then we go through um, the, the rest of them, short fiction 2, poetry 2, etc., all the way through 9. Now, a note here is really important. Many of the short stories and poems recommended by College Board are in our book, second edition, as, um, as are two or three long of, of the three longer works. Frankenstein and Hamlet are both in full in our book. And of the three long works in the binder, the third is uh, Their Eyes Were Watching God, and we have an excerpt of that as well. Um, and then, um, we have, if not the poem or story itself by, that is in the binder, we have um, others by that author. We have Rose for Emily, Girl, et cetera, just as the binder does. But, but the featured authors, Langston Hughes, John Donne, Elizabeth Bishop, and others, we, do, we have represented. So we're, we're happy to see a really close alignment between what's in the binder and what happens to be in our book. Okay, now let's go to the exam. Um, Larry, if I might just yep. make up another comment okay. here. Um, if you'll notice, one of the things that's interesting about the unit is I've, I've, when I've talked to a number of teachers who've just started looking at the framework, they often say, oh, well, this is more of a genre approach, and that's, that's, that's different. It isn't, actually, because this is a recursive approach that uses some short fiction working on certain skills, then adding the poetry, adding a, a longer work, then goes back to the short fiction to deepen those skills. So there, there is this kind of, I think they call it spiraling. Um, those spiraling, skills. that's right. I would, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I've done yeah. writing process for years, and we, we call it recursive. Yeah. But you're continuing to work with the similar skills, but deepening them, adding them, as the students grow stronger and stronger. So in many ways, this becomes an easy way to work with theme because you have basically right here you would have three thematic units or a unit that works with essential questions or a contemporary issue for you know something that that um, has a, that that brings all the skills together. Um, I yeah. have to comment too that when I was the director of freshman comp, I would not have been completely content with a paragraph, but that's another story. I'm going to move well, this on now. And Things, things <laughs> yeah. Um, in fact, I'm glad you mentioned the, uh, you know, the repetition, repetitious, or the returning, the recursive return. Uh, the spiraling uh, is there visually for us. A nice, nice presentation on page 17. You might note that in the bindings. Okay. Okay. Now the key changes. Wow. Um, we have 55 questions. No longer will there be somewhere between 54 and 57. There will be 55, still worth 45% of the exam for one hour. There will be five passages. We will have either two poems, complete poems, and three prose fiction passages, or three poems and two prose fiction passages. Okay, and I suspect that might flip flop year to year. I'm not sure. Okay, now the, the important thing here is each of the questions, each of the 55 questions will address 
those works of literature according to the big ideas. There'll be up to 20 questions on character. Um, and for those of us, <laughs> I was a little, not alarmed, but surprised when I saw setting as uh, looking equivalents to narration and figurative language, etc. But um, even though it's one of the big ideas, there'll be up to six questions on setting out of the 55. So 20, and then structure and narration, uh, there'll be uh, up to 20. There'll be up to 26 questions on figurative language and 13 on literary argument. So the, the main uh, areas are character, structure, figurative language, and um, comparison. Okay. Now, um, for Larry, part two. Yes. Um, yeah. I was going to ask, so in the multiple choice, the, on the new, starting in 2020, we will not have on the literature exam any of those uh, nonfiction uh, prose passages that are no. in literary criticism. We've had Carlisle. Yeah, that's a good point, because sometimes when there was a fifth short passage, it might have been a passage of literary criticism. But what I've been told is that there'll be three poems and two fiction passages, or the reverse. And th there's a great movement toward consistency on the exam from year to year. For example, the word was no more paired poems, because it was decided that if they had that question, they had it every year. So. The exam will be dependable, consistent. Um, before I go to part two, I will say that on the multiple choice, there'll be no more questions about synecdoche, economy, et cetera. A knowledge of those will, will be helpful, of course, but those will not be um, in the answers. So there's a movement away from questions that de depend for successful completion on knowledge rather than reading ability and analysis. There'll be no more normal Roman numeral questions, but they've been gone for years, actually, but teachers still ask about that. Um, okay, so now on, uh, oh, one other thing. They will, they will not be any longer a passage from a Shakespearean play for analysis as poetry, okay? It will not be on, on either part. the multiple choice or the essay. Uh, it's my understanding, especially on part two, but I believe on, on multiple choice as well. Of course, there, there may be a Shakespeare and sonnet, but uh, the attempt is to have complete works. So for part one, um, that suggests that, uh, well, you know, we won't have Paradise Lost or, you know, there are many many pieces that, that will not be cut up or excerpted. Okay, so for the literary argument question, this is interesting uh, to look at as it reflects on the entire test. There'll be among the list of about 40 texts in English, okay, there'll be roughly 50% gender mix. There will be 50% non-white writers, voices, and there will be 50% from 20th century, 25% from 320th, and 25% contemporary or 21st century. So we said, oh, this is changing uh, from the first slide because there was a predominance of 320th century uh, recently, and in the years past it was that way too. So works and, this is a little um, tricky. Works and translation will not be listed, however, there are certainly acceptable choices. I'm not sure exactly the reason for this, but you know, no more crime and punishment, no more Oedipus, et cetera, okay? Uh, among those listed, that would not prevent any teacher from, from using those, okay? Something encouraged, or, oh sure, any student to, to use it, yeah, sure. Um, but non-American texts written in English are recommended from, you know, Caribbean, Anglo-Indian, et cetera, recommended. So when we're, we're, when we're looking at particularly works predominantly written in English, we're not restricting that to, you know, the, the 50 United States or, or England. Okay, so I think 
that's pretty much covered. Let's go to the next one, which will be much well, quicker. Well, I just want to comment. You have some I, I just want to comment. Yeah, the, the, the literary argument we used to ask on the committee would say, um, well, people would say, how, how did the committee come up with that list? And, you know, it was mm. kind of random in some ways. But I remember one time someone on the committee said, well, we look at books that have been challenged in school, and we like to think about putting those on the list sometime because then teachers will, it'll be on the list, and teachers will be able to teach those works or at least they'll have an argument for teaching those works. And I think we know mm -hmm. that those lists tend to influence the course. This is not a bad set of parameters at all for our course. No. I mean, works in translation is a little strange that it's not on the list. I'm, I'm not sure the logic of that either. But as long as the kids can write on them, we can still teach them. Sure. Uh, but and the, yep. the non-American texts are obviously an effort to get an inter, you know, include more international texts. And here you've got 25% of, of the works that are going to be listed are 21st century. So in some ways, it's actually privileging the 21st century, because so far, we just barely have 20, don't quite have 20 years. And, and yeah. that's really going to, I think, challenge most of us to keep up in different ways. And so I think this is actually yeah. likely to, um, to influence the course um, the choices teachers make in their courses in a very positive in a very positive way. Yeah, and okay. if, if we may say so, um, this is you know we, we didn't have this formula until a few months ago, but it, it kind of resembles what we've been working at in our books yeah. for years. Absolutely. Yeah. Many of you may see. It. All right. Um, this will be quick. The next one. Instruction is FRQ. You know, free response questions. I always say essays, but now I suppose I should say FRQ. Um, we'll see in a moment or two what that means, the instructions, uh, how they're changed. Um, connections to the six-point rubric. Well, it's one, four, one. Um, you know, as you know, as, and as we'll see, one for thesis, not necessarily thesis statement, but thesis, four for explanations, commentary, analysis, and then the sophistication. Uh, the stable wording in the prompt is something that is new, and the desire is for consistency from year to year. Okay, and next. I put, I put stable in quotation marks here, yeah. but you'll, we uh, have examples here. So, with yeah. the, And we know that the College Board is doing a webinar to familiarize people with the six-point rubric. I'm sure many of you will, will be listening to that. But so we're just going to go over it um, at least enough to uh, familiarize everyone with it um, if you're not already. Yeah, and we're not going to say much more than, than this right now because um, that would be a full one or two hour webinar of its own to actually work through. Um, yeah. For those of you who have seen it, I think you understand what I mean. Um, okay, the yeah, the, the webinar is forthcoming. It's actually at seven o'clock <laughs> as soon as we're done. The first of them. Okay. Well, now, what, here's what, what we're going to excuse here, me. What we're going to do here now is, I'm sorry, Larry, is is to look at well, the. Two questions. We're going to poetry. Larry will talk about the fact that poetry and prose have very, very similar explanation. All these um, these three things yeah. are very similar on poetry and prose. Then they are, and then so we're going to look at poetry, and then we'll look at the literary argument um, just to see yeah. examples of these. And I'm I'm going to Larry. I have my scoring guidelines right here, and I have a couple of notes on them, so I will be jumping in, but. Here we go with yeah. poetry. Take away. Okay, um, but just first the um, the one to six lengthy uh, rubric. Um, you'll notice for poetry and for um, prose fiction questions one and two are very very similar. Uh, I think that's what you were suggesting. Okay, so now um, we'll see the, the the new language that we talked about before. This is something new. Um, and we never, well, we, we had to make a lot of inferences for, for years, decades, about, well, how long the works would be, et cetera. So now, you know, they're saying well, 100 to 300 words. 
and a passage of poetry. Um, and uh, as I said, it's my understanding that on, at least on part two, they would be only full poems. So let's see for, for part one. Um, but at any rate, the response for, for part two, they respond to the prompt to the thesis that presents a defensible interpretation. This will be in the question. Select and use evidence to support your line of reasoning. Explain how the evidence supports your line of reasoning. There's that key word, how. And then use appropriate grammar and punctuation in communicating your argument. These were kind of givens in uh, experienced teachers' classrooms, but this will be actually stated in the prompt. And I think here what you've seen is we're moving from holistic to a, an analytical scoring. And, yeah. you know, I've, I've worked on many, many um, standardized tests. I've, you know, worked on the, the GED and the state test, um, the SAT. I've never seen a one to nine scale. And you know that for years it was nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So it was kind of moving toward that six-point scale, but that doesn't, I mean, sort of the five-point scale, but in assessment, we know we don't want a middle, we don't want a big middle, because that's where everything falls, um, yeah. or tends to fall, and you have a lot of training issues. So the six-point scale is actually a, a pretty, for those of you who work with state testing, you're probably pretty familiar with it already, but it is interesting that those four bullets that Larry just read um, will be on the question. I mean, it'll say, in your response, you should do the following, and then those four bullets are there, and basically that's on every question. Then the scoring guide particularizes it, but this is a, on every question, so we're going yeah, to and, and, and most of us are, by now, highly familiar, except new teachers new to the course, perhaps, with the completely, almost completely holistic scoring that we had with the one to nine. And, you know, the opposite of that or, or you know, opposed to that would be the, the kind of trait scoring where you're looking for certain features. I think the new one that we have here is it's kind of in between. It's kind of holistic and analytic without becoming overly dependent on searching for traits. So here we have does the piece respond with a thesis that presents a defensible interpretation, a defensible interpretation? Okay, that may be, uh, that's of course as the student interprets it but must defend it. This does not necessarily have to be a thesis statement. There's been a lot of dialogue about that. It might not be a bad recommendation for many kids, but it, it can be anywhere in the essay. Now, um, Line of reasoning is, is a new phrase that everyone's becoming familiar with now. It's in both courses. Um, it, it, it kind of looks at whether a student's approach is consistent throughout and whether the student actually follows the thesis of the paper throughout. It's about consistency of commentary and explanation. So we have evidence and commentary. Um, these commentary is not a word we use too much in the past, but um, of course it, it, it fits naturally. So we also have to explain how the literary elements or techniques in the poem contribute to its meaning. Um, again, we look at elements, strategies, etc., a little bit differently from we look at terms. Um, however, while the Terms such as synecdoche, et cetera, will not be on part one. There's nothing that would prevent a student from write about, writing about such features if that student fully understands them and can demonstrate um, logically how they contribute to the, to the text. So sophistication of thought could be um, in terms of um, writing or developing a complex literary argument. Uh, there will be many ways to achieve the sophistication of thought points. I, I, I have to say here on the, the four points, a couple of things here on the, on the second category. Um, and that is that I think multiple literary elements or techniques, you're going to find those embedded in your big ideas. So first person narrative, 
versus an omniscient narrator, for example, in fiction, that, that's really a technique uh, or a literary element. Um, and so it's, it's not the synecdoche, as Larry, as Larry has said several times. Right. It's not yeah. that technical level. But there, you that's know, actually, how do you get that in? Yeah, and it falls under the new category, you know, one of the big ideas, actually. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, the so dialogue, for example. Yeah. You know, description, yeah. detail, physical de description of a character's physical appearance. And then I also want to comment that um, in the in the in the revi revised the new new rubric, um, yeah. we have this statement at the bottom of this category, and it says writing that suffers from grammatical and/or mechanical errors that interfere with communication cannot earn the fourth point. So that it, a, a paper that has a number of grammatical errors again interfering with communication is a little bit subjective, but we know what that means that that yeah. would prohibit a student because otherwise there's not really any place in the rubric that that grammatical um, and punctuation um, criterion could be is, is addressed. It's right there. And as Larry said, the sophistication is the part for me, I thought, oh Lord, this is going to be hard because it's, it's going to be just murky. But they actually do spell it out. They have like, on, on this one, for example, yeah. there are four possibilities. And I think, you know, I was working with a student who said, I, I'm good with, I'm pretty good with the logic and the thesis, but I, I don't know how I'm going to earn the sophistication points. And actually, we started to talk about what this one means and what that one means and what the other one means. And it makes a lot of sense. Uh, so I think it's, it's, not, it's not as holistic as it seems. I think it's, it's, um, it's pretty specific. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so here okay. we have the concept or idea similar to in the past, and they'll have about 40 works. Um, and of course, their task is to analyze how, once again, the concept or idea described in the question contributes to an interpretation of the work as a whole. So the first, you know, the first thing a student has to do, uh, without thinking about the, the literary concept or idea, even is Think about the interpretation of the work as a whole, and and then how the idea contributes to that. Then finally look at you know the, the, the features in, in the book that uh, contribute to that. But here again we have the bullet points: respond respond to this prompt in the thesis that present presents a defensible interpretation. Defensible, I think, being the key word. Provide evidence to support that explain how it supports it, and then use an appropriate grammar and punctuation and communicate in your arguments. Um, this hasn't changed that much from what we call the open question, but it's becoming more particular in terms of the idea of defending and supporting and explaining your interpretation because that interpretation has a thesis, which is a claim to be argued. Okay, so the next slide continues with the same question. And the text in italics on the questions will vary, of course, uh, according to the concept or idea. But the prompt itself will be pretty consistent. Okay, uh, there'll be a lead that introduces a concept and idea. Okay either your own reading or something below. And then, you know, well-written essay, again, you know, I'll be repeating myself, um, explain how that idea contributes to the interpretation of the work as a whole. And it will say, do not merely summarize the plot um, as we've always uh, assumed, but now we will say that. Okay, so here we have it. Um, thesis, evidence, commentary, sophistication. And a paper that demonstrates, as Renee said, uh, many errors that interfere with communication cannot receive the fourth point in the middle part. I would suspect, I hesitate to say anything definitively, but I would suspect it would be less likely to receive even the third 
for the sophistication. But um, you know, there's a caveat: cannot receive the four. Yeah, and and okay. I think here that yeah, this, and this notion of sophistication here in the literary argument. One of the, the things, you know, in the, in the previous, uh, the way the previous scoring guide was written, we also, the students could be bumped up a point in literature if they had particularly good writing, okay? And I think sometimes we would say, oh gosh, you know, the, I can teach to the six or seven, but it's really hard to teach to the eight or nine. And, and that's true, of course, in some ways. But here, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the student sample yeah. because one of, one of the it's to some degree analogous to the you know what brought a six to a seven or an eight to a nine but at the same time I think we'll confuse ourselves if we try to make too much link between the nine point and the six um, well, because it'll be eight, interesting to see. yeah, yeah. I mean, here, one of the ways that uh, sophistication is illuminating the student's interpretation by situating it within a broader context. Well, that sounds, yeah. for example, like historical context and the like. So it'll be interesting to see what the student papers look like that are that are, are illustrating these different ways of achieving the sophistication. Again, I think the thesis evidence commentary, very teachable. Not so easy to master, but very teachable. The sophistication is really pushing the student a little bit further. But at least it's becoming very, it's very specific yeah. here. Well, with this new framework, if we could just go back to that just for a second. How eminently teachable is it to work with thesis? Here we can make sure, if we're concerned with the exam points, that we can teach students to have a thesis. We can teach them to move up that middle scale. The sophistication point, that's a little harder. You know, what language do we use? They will learn that in a good class through the year. But it's almost impossible to say, well, this is the way I teach sophistication of writing. It's a process that we work with through the year, I'm sure, you know, in all of your great classes, that's something that happens with the kids. Yeah. Okay, the next, now here we get to the connection. All right, I, I'm going to talk about an example here, but Lisa, may I ask you before I get started here, because I'm being, I'm trying to be mindful of the time, do we have a number of questions? No, we're good. So far, so good. I've been answering what I can and um, nothing content related just yet, Renee. Okay, all oh. right. So I will okay. take a a little, little bit of time here to go over some of this. Um, one of the things, and, and Larry will jump in um, as, yeah. as, he, um, as he wants to and help clarify what I'm saying. The new overall distributions, which Larry already mentioned in the course of the way you're supposed to afford, the college board is suggesting that you uh, develop your class, is that 42 to 49 percent will be short fiction, poetry 36 to 45, which in my non-mathematical mind is 50 percent, so I'm good. Um, and longer fiction and drama is 15 to 18 percent. Now, I think the way most of us have organized the literature class in the past has been more actually anchored by longer fiction and drama. Um, and then in the days of people coming into workshops I was giving in the life and saying, well, I have 20 books to teach. Well, by the end of the workshop, they would choose the six or five or whatever that they were going to teach. Sure. But because, as Larry said earlier, better to teach a few things well and in depth. We also often uh, structure our courses so that students have a lot of um, freedom to choose. You know, we do, this book is what we're doing in class, but then you'll choose among these others, and whether it's reading circles or however you would organize it. But there's a real privileging here of short fiction, and I think it reflects what we're seeing in classrooms in general. I'm not going to get on a soapbox here about nobody reads, they don't read books anymore, whatever. But, you know, I was reading a review today about um, a new collection by Zadie Smith, and the review was talking about the fact that we're going through a time right now where there is just this amazingly good short fiction. And, of course, most of us know there has been amazingly good short fiction for a very long time. But it, it just is enjoying um, uh, a real 
engagement and there's some, a lot of experimentation going on. And I, I think it's not just a matter of, oh, well, because people like to read sound bites. I think there's something about the experience of reading short fiction that's very compelling. And we've always said that short fiction, short stories often have the compression of poetry. And so for that reason, they're, they're a wonderful place to do the language. And if those of you who've taken uh, workshops from me know that I often suggested that short fiction was a good way to practice for what was then called the open question. So mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about one particular short story here, but I think this short fiction is, is really important. Because if you look at this, basically it's, if you use, you know, say 42%, oh, God, I hope I don't make a mistake here, and miss add, um, but, you know, you could end up easily with almost 60% of your course, between 50 and 55 and 60% of your course in um, longer fiction and short fiction. So, you know, if you have, okay, I have the poetry here, but I'm using so much short fiction more than of the longer work. I, I think that's going to help kids with the multiple choice, but it's also in some ways going to maybe make them lifelong readers because they they maybe don't want to read novels and you can't talk them into reading novels for the rest of their life. Do not believe that I am suggesting that you do not teach novels or full plays uh, by any no. means. But I'm just saying that in many ways they may know somebody like Edwige Danticat through her short stories rather than her novels. Um, Davy Smith, for example, in the reading is Davy Smith's novel is quite an investment um, and an investment that's worth worthwhile, but it's, if reading some of her yeah, stories yeah. also allows you to, to do a little sampling here and there. Well, incidentally, so I, I, Renee, you, yeah, you say you read a review of, of her work of short fiction by her. In um, New York Review of Books, which arrived today, she has an essay on, on the, the importance of fiction in general. I can just recommend it. So it's nice to hear her yeah, come up. No, I agree. Yeah. Um, um, and in literature and composition, we have met, we have 22 short stories, and of those, four are central. Um, you know, we are. If you don't know the books, there we have a central yeah. text and a, and a classic text in each one. Um, but four short stories are actually a central text. These are more um, contemporary: Edwin Danticat, Tim O'Brien, uh, Jean-Paul Lahiri, and Flannery O'Connor. We have two novellas, and I'm not sure if that's short fiction or longer fiction for the uh, by the College Board's Reckoning, but it's in all likelihood, I think, probably longer. But Kafka's Metamorphosis and James Joyce's The Dead. And then we do have Frankenstein and Heart of Darkness in two full novels, and then four plays, August Wilson's Fences and The Importance of Being Earnest, and then both Hamlet and Othello. So there's quite a lot to choose from here, and I, I think it, you know, it would work well with with the College Board's new framework. Larry, were you going to say um, something um, else? Just something uh, uh, also, uh, we have well over 100 poems. Just, uh, we didn't have, we didn't count the exact number. I, I kept losing track as I went through the book, but 22 short stories, but over 100 poems. So, um, you know, two dozen or so throughout each thematic chapter. Yeah. So lots of yeah. choices. And, so what I did, and oh, those ahead, of you who know, those of you who know the book, um, realize that um, you know each of these major works fits within a theme, and not only that, but for the for the major central works, we have um, a whole text and context section, which we really enjoy. So what I did was go into. <laughs> I went into the short fiction, Everyday Youth by Alice Walker. It's such a wonderful story. I'm sure all of you know it. Um, and I looked at Unit 1, Short Fiction 1, which would be the beginning of the school year. So yeah. on the one hand, I thought, I'm going to use, when I first started thinking about this, I thought, I'm going to use James Baldwin's Sunny's Blues, because I wanted to use the theme, Tradition and Progress. Um, and I and Sunny's Blues is one of my all-time favorites. Um, I love the Walker story, but Sunny's Blues is just up there in the you know celestial world. Um, but I think it's not appropriate for the very beginning. But everyday use really is. Um, it's uh, shorter for one, and I think it also emphasizes character um, in so many ways. And and of course um, setting and and narration. 
uh, are accessible through it. So I thought, okay, if I have 10 class periods, and I want to use the theme, tradition, and progress, and maybe I'm going to move toward Frankenstein. We'll have to see. How would I organize it? So, you know, I'd love to hear responses to this, um, but here we go. Day one, connections and explorations. I like, I love themes, I love issues, and I have always worked with students in that way, so at least in, in introductory classes. So I, thought I might start by saying, in what ways do you consider yourself to be traditional? What does that mean? And, and is that a positive quality? Are tradition and progress inevitably intention or conflict? You know, I'm not sure students at the very beginning are used to these kind of open questions. For some of you, your students will come very skilled in answering these kinds of questions. They're addressing them. They're not even particularly answerable. But for some of you, you're probably opening up a whole world of, of in, interpretation. And then, I, again, when have you or someone you've known rejected a tradition in the family or culture? What were the results or consequences? Um, and then I always like to ask about what's around them. What is a movie or one of the gazillion series you've watched on television or streaming where tradition or traditions are being challenged? I mean, you know, The Godfather, for one, I mean, and then probably something that was made last week. What or who caused the challenge? So these are just pre-reading kind of explorations, every one of them having to do, I hope, to everyday use. Then overview of character setting, plot, and narrator. I mean, we have an uh, opening chapter of literature and composition beginning on page 16 um, called The Big Picture, Analyzing Fiction and Drama. And I just, right there, our, our Place, what we're looking at are plot, character, setting, point of view. There's also a, a, a section on style. Um, and so, and these are the authors that we, we use in our discussion of them. So I might spend a day kind of going over those short pieces. This is, this is, this is a, an introductory chapter, very straightforward, not highly technical, but just the kind of thing that would give kids a foundation. And from yeah, there... And, and those, um, those, uh, excerpts there, by the way. Um, the Welch is James Welch, the uh, Native American writer, by the way, in case we're wondering. And that Roth is not Philip, but Henry Roth. Some call it Philip. Right. And while we're on character, we might mention that the entire um, text and context section about Hamlet is all about character as well. And then I would interrupt. start... I and mean, when I, with everyday use, I would just start with the narrator because it begins with Mala. I mean, she's talking. She's. I mean, that's where it is, and you're just immediately situated in her head. And so I would. Um, I, I. What I have here, I've listed some of the questions that are already in the book. But the 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 skill here, according to the College Board, is identify and describe the narrator or speaker. So I thought I would look at the opening section before we even meet Maggie or Dee. How do we know what we know? What does Walker give the, why does Walker give the story to Mama? In what ways is she the family authority? Now, that question, I realize, assumes the kids have read the whole story. If they haven't, if they're just starting, I try to come up with some read aloud things, some paragraphs that would immediately getting in, getting them in, get them into, excuse me, the narrator. In this one, I love that section, in real life, I am a large, big-boned woman. And then you get into that notion of appearance. And then also those, their self-descriptions about mama. That yeah. begins to talk well, about to, character, to just, too. If I may jump in here, Irene, uh, just apart from the nature of this particular story itself, I, I, it's nice the way you have, you know, every day you use questions 2, 3, 5, and 10 um, relate to narrator. And as we'll see, for each of these ideas, we've noted the questions that address that particular feature in the framework. And um, I, I can't really direct you to this now, but in our supplementary material online, we've done this for the entire for the entire book, shown how each of the units in the PED works uh, in alignment with, with uh, everything in our book. OK, back to you, Renee. I'm going to paste okay. that link in the chat, Larry, so that everyone has the site that you're referring to. Yeah, okay, good. I know, yeah, you're the one, Lisa, to, to do that. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Well, I'm not going to read all these to you. You can go back to them, but I want to just get through them a little bit quickly here. And I, I would spend four or five days, uh, I'm sorry, days four and five, two days on character of that 10, asking what do you make of Maggie's first question to her mother, then working in pairs, choose a character, describe one element of the character's perspective, cite two specific details. So what I'm trying to weave through here is what the students are going to be asked to do, either for an formative assessment are actually on an exam. So immediately they're doing close textual analysis. What is your interpretation of these motives? And so with the short stories, you can work with both the literary interpretation as well as the close reading questions. Um, setting right. also, I think it's very important in this one. Just identify and describe a specific textual describe specific textual details that convey or reveal a setting. And, and I was thinking as a teacher, I might spend two days on this because there's so many elements to setting, including symbol. The, the geographical setting of the South, the yard, the interior of the house, and I think the quilts become part of the setting, or at least that's, I know they're a symbol, but they also are part of the setting. Where do you display them? How do you use them? How do they become part of your life? Uh, day seven, plot and structure. Yeah. Uh, again, yeah. uh, there's some read aloud stuff here, but the interesting thing is about this, it's kind of complicated because you have a, a linear plot moving from the beginning when D arrives to the end when she leaves, but there's so much history that comes in here. The past intrudes in one, not intrude, well, it does intrude, but the past is also accounted for in, in so many interesting ways. Walker's such a, a skilled um, uh, storyteller with this one. So then it's by the end, what happens to motivate mama brings us to, again, a question that is fully interpretive. Um, narration I will return to instead of putting those days together because I, I think it gets more complicated with mama and D. Now, I'm going to go quickly to the end here. The last two days I would work on a literary <laughs> argument, develop textually substantiated arguments. I would ask students to return to their responses. How does your reading of everyday use confirm, challenge, or somehow modify your initial response? Which gives them a chance to kind of go back and think about what tradition means or what heritage means. And then revise your paragraph by focusing specifically on this prompt. How does Alice Walker show the conflict between family traditions and the progress that education promises? Um, again, for a lot of kids who are first generation college, this story would speak to them, even though it doesn't take place in contemporary times, I think it would really uh, speak to them. So I just wanted to end by taking all of the course and the exam issues that are swirling, I think, in everyone's head right now and show how this actually does fit very nicely into a kind of combination of skills and um, theme or issues. Renee, I yeah. do have one um, question. If there's a break here um, for questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll just end, Lisa, by saying, this is, is this the site that you were sending to people, Lisa? This is the That's one right. on, uh, yeah, this is the one to, uh, that where there, there are pacing guides and various other kinds of things. Okay, Lisa, yeah. what's my question? Sure, I've got two for you, and uh, we'll also address what you just said. There's the AP Update site where you can find uh, pacing guides, videos, and all kinds of great documents. Um, and resources for not a, not just AP Lit, but AP Lang as well, and if you have colleagues in other disciplines for all of the other courses we publish in. There are additional multiple choice questions for Lang. I'm only mentioning that on this um, call because I've got a couple people that were on last week's webinar and they're asking, um, and those can be found um, at a separate secure site. Those are just for Lang, um, and if you, if you want access to those, you can um, you can actually just email, email us at hsmarketing at bfwpub.com. Um, or you can get to us through the update site. So the questions for you directly, oh, and for everyone else asking, yes, we will send out the slides and we will send out the recording. Um, usually within 24 hours, we have the recording. Um, got a couple questions here now. The first, would you spend almost the entire units for short fiction on a single story? Uh, no, I don't think I would. At the beginning here, I might. And some of the units also have more time at the, at, you know, to work on them. But I, when I was working on this, I kept thinking, well, I want to send them out to another story. But at the beginning here, because I would be introducing those elements, 
I might stay with one story. Again, if the kids come in and they've been reading short fiction, I'm showing you with my hands again. Um, if they're, they're reading short fiction and, and they're accustomed to it, then probably I, I would be able to take do things maybe in fewer days, and then I would make sure that they were able to um, do maybe even their summative assessment. Instead of going back to the question at the beginning, I would say, why don't you now go to your another story, one of these two stories, and 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 um, and, and write your paragraph using that. But at least at the beginning, and I know that so many of these changes have been made to try to help with access. Uh, to, to make students comfortable with what these literary elements are, what the, what the um, characters, narration, setting um, involve, I think I might stay with one story. I think I yeah. probably would stay with one story. And I, I, I think another feature of, of that, Renee, is that you referred to um, the opening chapters. So we would be kind of spiraling back to the instructional uh, content regarding these features as we would That's go. Right stories as well so great yes great we have uh, two more actually on similar topics so the first is if we are being asked to teach a majority of short fiction why are students not able to use shorter fiction on the FRQ3 well I'm not the right person yeah, to ask that's the, <laughs> well, that's the 15 to 18 <laughs> percent that's all I yeah. can I don't know what else to say and we that's don't a really want really good to, question you're absolutely we right. You're discourage. absolutely right. Yeah. We don't want to discourage reading of longer works. But if we take a look at 15 to 18 percent of, of focus on long works, um, I really think we want students to know a few texts well. Um, I would rather have them read carefully and know well four works than, than skim eight, which is what happens. Um, and they're they're discouraged from writing about short works on that third question. It's a good uh, question, though, and and I, yeah. I think it yeah. you know, maybe you bring your short stories around your major works because really, if it's eighteen percent, it's one a quarter. If you're doing, I mean, that's really what it is. Um, we have a follow-up yeah. here. Um, I'm sorry to cut you off. It seems like it, it could fit here nicely, which was, would you approach long fiction with the same format? I'm sorry? Would you approach <laughs> longer fiction? Would you approach longer fiction with the same format? You mean yes, the same I format would. everyday use? Uh, yeah. Uh, I would continue to work with those big ideas throughout, absolutely. But when I do, whenever I taught long fiction to freshmen, even in, in college, I would make sure that I had short stories and maybe even some nonfiction to go with it because it just took them a long time to read a, a full novel. Um, and, and now I know a lot of us use audiobooks and the like in the classroom. But I, but I think the question is probably focused on how, you know, how we would deepen this, uh, these, these various these various big ideas, and also much more on language. I mean, you, you can't read, I mean, reading Walker out loud, you're using language, but, you know, that notion of comparison, which, as Larry said, is metaphor, as well as, you know, other uh, addiction, syntax, all of those things, um, with the longer work, I would do that. But I, I think the longer work would involve, I think usually it's, what is it, 17 uh, I'd have to look back exactly to like 17 classes. That's a lot of classes on on just hard on you know one 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 work. So I, I think I would um, try to bring in some other things, some other some other literary work. Yeah, I've long. I, I've never taught that it's been one to teach or say use a novel and address it every day for weeks. Um, no. Every, every, I think I would integrate so many different uh, pieces uh, thematically, poetry, short stories, etc. I think the relentless approach to doing the same novel every day for weeks is, is a killer. Because, oh, unless you but Tony Morris, at the same time, it's wonderful. <laughs> however, I said unless it's Tony Morrison. If it's Tony yeah, Morrison, okay. I can do it every single day. <laughs> but with, um, 
with a play, I, I would would do that absolutely though, more than with a novel. But as you say, the big ideas here um, are, are certainly uh, as applicable to a longer work as they are to a short story or a poem. We might maybe work a little um, less overall with the exam in mind on figurative language, perhaps. But everything else is pretty much what they're going to be writing about. Perfect. As they address and, that literary argument. Perfect. I think we have, if you have time, we have time for one final question. And the person who asked is still on, so um, I figured I would ask it. For those of you asking about start times and such, I just want to remind everyone, um, this is the BFW AP Lit updates. There is also a College Board Updates webinar that's not related to this webinar. That started at 7. So some questions about start times coming in. I just wanted to clear that. Um, the final uh -huh. question here is, I noticed on the list of highly suggested novellas, novels, and plays that the writers are not as diverse as the test may be, specifically in gender and cultural diversity. Should we try then to get diversity from the short stories and poetry, or is there a list of, quote, must-reads for novels that are more diverse? Oh, yeah, it's boy. interesting because the, that's a really good question because the Frankenstein, the yeah. Watching God, and Hamlet, are, there's not a 21st century work in there. Um, but you do have two women and a man. You have one person yeah. of color. So I think there is an effort to, to hit those categories. But you're absolutely right. In the short stories, it, the short stories and the poetry, there's such yeah. richness. And uh, so that is where where I think you we've we've all well, been able to just bring in such a, a range. I haven't analyzed the, the, the list, but if we look at the, the list for the uh, literary argument sample on page 151 of the binder, there's a good deal of diversity there and contemporary works. Perhaps not the 50-50, uh, et cetera, yet. But, or the 50% non-white, but the movement is toward that. And as I said, um, that's the formula for that question, but when I asked about whether that would apply generally over the entire exam, and by extension, whether we would see that as an operating principle for our entire course, the answer would be, would be yes. So we, it, we can certainly find um, that we can apply that diversity formula or guideline with uh, yeah. the fic well, short fiction and poetry much more easily perhaps than with the longer ones. Yeah. If that answered your question. Good question. Thank you. Very yeah. nice. Yeah, this, that's something that we'll be looking at through the year. Yeah. Very good Wonderful. question. Wonderful. So that concludes all of our questions then. I think everything's oh. been answered. I want to thank everyone for coming. Thank Renee and Larry so much for all of your insights and information. And remind everyone that the slides and the recording will be sent out um, before the end of the week. And if you have any questions at all, just reach out to me, Lisa Erdely, at L-E-R-D-E-L-Y at bfwpub.com. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, again. thank you, Lisa. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you, all, thank you, Larry. all the teachers. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.